Good morning. A warm welcome to all of you from wherever you are, here with us in Amsterdam, in Beirut or in Pretoria or online. My name is Lindy van Vliet. I'm delighted to welcome you to this 2022 Power of Knowledge event. Whether you are joining us virtually or physically, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to the Power of Knowledge Symposium. My name is Francis Kombe. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for EthicsPAT. Good morning to all our participants. My name is Lina Abu Habib. I'm the director of the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship at the American University of Beirut. KIT is an independent center of expertise and education. We strive to make knowledge work for a more inclusive and sustainable world. We are guided by the SDGs and we are joined by a community of like-minded organizations here at our campus in Amsterdam. EthicsPAT is a non-profit company uh, which is headquartered in uh, Pretoria in South Africa. Our vision is to inspire responsible and ethical research capacities in and for Africa by building uh, the capacities of institutions in Africa to deliver responsible and ethical research and to address existing uh, health and social challenges facing Africa. KIT advisors have decades and decades of experience in partnering uh, and establishing relationships and do this based on the values that we cherish in our organizations. Values around inclusivity, transparency and equity. However, despite best intentions, it's not always easy to make sure these relationships are equitable. Ingrained power imbalances also are reflected in our relationships with our partners. This we want to change. Equality equity and moving away from the traditional north to south relationships in, develop, in development cooperation is critical to sustainable research and development. How do we truly, truly make this partnership equitable and fair? These and many other questions, I hope we can find an answer to together today at this event. We will be exploring ex important uh, topics. These are conversations that it's high time for all of us to have decolonizing knowledge, what does it mean, how, why, but also how do we build, how do we co-create equitable knowledge partnerships, north-south, south-south, etc. We have invited experts from diverse backgrounds and expertise who are going to engage you as participants to evoke your insights on equitable knowledge partnerships and how critical these are in unlocking uh, power of knowledge and most importantly invite you to participate in discussions aimed at identifying some of the opportunities and challenges related to indigenization of knowledge and most importantly why inclusivity and fair knowledge partnerships is important. I'm hoping that all of us will leave this event with ideas, with action points and also with um, a tangible example that they would like to implement at the end of this conference. May I take this opportunity to welcome uh, you on board and uh, look forward to an exciting Power of Knowledge Symposium. See you later this afternoon and looking forward to a very fruitful day. Wishing you all the best. So, welcome everybody. My name is Amma van Danzig, also popularly known as Amma Fantastic. Uh, I'm overpromising, of course. Um, I have the great honor of being the host uh, today. I don't have to be as knowledgeable as you. You will be doing all the work. I get to be the stage robot, and I get to throw this box around. Um, I don't know how many of you have done this before, um, but the idea is that you speak your questions, thoughts, and ideas into the box. And then everybody can hear it. Um, so, and, and it's fun, you can throw it around. Um, and uh, that's how we will be asking our questions today. So that's one of the things I wanted to tell you as an opening. I'm very excited about our day here today. And we're going to be having fun discussions and difficult discussions. And in order to do this, um, 
in a way that uh, is still open, I think it's helpful to set some, for most of us, obvious ground rules. Is that okay? But before we do that, I want to uh, highlight what's going on behind me, because we're not doing this alone. It's a collaborative effort, of course. You saw in the video, uh, the previous video, we have partners in South Africa and partners in Beirut. So let's wave at each other. Let's wave. Hi, everyone. Are they waving back? Yes, there. It's as simple as that, connecting to each other. So thank you so much for being here with us. We'll be together uh, online um, for most of the day. And uh, at one point when we have the, the coffee break, those of us in South Africa can connect with those of us here. There's a laptop out there, so it would be nice if you can send a quick message. If you don't do it, I definitely will. So let's see who gets there first. Um, but the box in my hand, the ground rules. We're going to continue with our ground rules. Have a great day, guys, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, let's, wave, let's wave goodbye once again. Yay. Nice. Um, so back here where we are, we have uh, people online joining us. We have us ourselves here. So we have to be aware of the powers that are not visible in the room. They are there. We are here together. Uh, there will be someone moderating the chat online. And uh, those of us here, you will be stuck with me and a few facilitators in the breakout rooms. Now, the box. When am I finally going to get to the box? We'll be talking into the box, and how will we talk to each other? Well, let's agree that we won't have long reflections. We will try to think carefully and formulate our contributions in question form so that other people have enough time to also ask or contribute theirs. Is this okay? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, can we also agree that we will try and listen to each other openly, even if we say things that might be uncomfortable, that we might not agree with? Can we agree that we will do our best to stay open to what is being said? Because I assume that there will be ideas being presented here that might not be what we've always thought. There might be ideas here that will make us shift the way we think or challenge the way we think, and we might actually resist shifting to agree. So can we perhaps agree to stay open, listen, and respond respectfully? Is this okay? And maybe not anything radical, right? All right. I think that's enough for ground rules. And the rest, we are, most people here, above 18. So we can agree that we're adults, and we know the difference between right and wrong. We know what is respect. And we'll talk about values later. All right. I won't uh, keep you much longer. Um, it is now time for me to welcome Lindy from Fleet, who said she'll see you this afternoon. But it's still morning, Lindy. Um, um, she's the head of the knowledge unit at KIT. Please give her a warm round of applause. Um, Lindy, how good are you at catching? With, I'll try. We can do a one-hand throw, a one-hand catch. It's easy Let's for me. Let's try. You yes. did it. Yes, yes, good job. If I can do yeah. it, you should be able to do it, too. <laughs> okay, so I'll take it back. Don't throw it back to me. Uh, Lindy is the head of the Knowledge Unit at KIT and the coordinator of SDG3 Alliance and the founding member of the Dutch Global Health Alliance. So she has a lot of experience in this field of international development and cooperation. Please give her a warm round of applause as she addresses you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed, with the risk that I uh, become repetitive after the welcome, but truly a warm welcome again to all the participants here in Amsterdam and everybody who's joining us uh, online. We're so grateful that you're here and we're so much looking forward to this day. Uh, you are at, an, uh, at a really uh, great moment with us because uh, you are witnessing the first edition of the Power of Knowledge series that KIT aims to launch from now on. So uh, in like 10, 20 years, you'll look back at that first Power of Knowledge. I was there. No, but uh, seriously, um, why do we want to launch this series? Why do we so strongly believe in the Power of Knowledge? Well, because it's basically the identity of our institute, obviously. But also, why do we think it's important to talk about the power of knowledge? 
Well, um, we think that it's very, very, very important to address the power of knowledge, now more than ever. Knowledge is sometimes a contested area, and knowledge is also, uh, for its transformative power, a contested area. And that's why it's important to address it up front and to really look, uh, as with any contested uh, resource, who actually has, uh, not who has access, who can set the knowledge agenda, who can actually use knowledge, who, can, uh, for, who, who validates what knowledge is right and what knowledge is not right. All these questions are extremely important to unleash the power of knowledge and to make knowledge work to accelerate impacts towards the SDGs. Because that's what Asfari Institute, Ethi Experts and Kids strongly believe in together. So that's where this series and the power of knowledge came from. But then partnership. This is a topic, of course, that we've been discussing in the international cooperation field quite a lot. Decolonizing our work, decolonizing global health, decolonizing uh, the discussions on food systems, decolonizing knowledge. Um, extremely important discussion, and because partnerships is at the core, right? SDG 17, with we work together. Without working together, we can never, never achieve the SDGs. But working together is not automatically a way of equal relationships. This we also know. So, power of knowledge, as knowledge is an important topic, and partnerships at, and equal partnerships at the core of uh, unleashing the power of knowledge. That's what today is about. So, let's start walking the talk. But if you start on a walk, you need to know where you depart from, right? We already talked a bit about decolonization, and I think it's important in that respect to ground ourselves where we are here today, in this institute. KIT is now a center of international expertise and uh, equal collaboration, but it has a past. It has a colonial past. Between 1926 and 1949, it was home to the colon Dutch Colonial Institute. And when you've entered today's Marble Hall, and you've probably witnessed a lot of um, yeah, um, images and, and ornaments that still show this, not this history. And we think it's very important to be aware of that. If you've actually entered the doors here of, the, of this uh, Maxima Hall, there's three pictures above it. And maybe over lunch or over the coffee break, you can walk out and you can look around at these pictures. It's a triptych, and it um, symbolizes how in, the, in those days, in the 20s, 30s, we were looking at the East, the West, and at collaboration. And maybe the last one, collaboration, is very fitting for today. You see the picture here at my back, and maybe it already raises, it gives you certain feelings. You see um, a, a colonial... Uh, governor sitting, and you see uh, a, a, an inhabitant of Java actually discussing with uh, this person irrigation plans or any other plan. And what's the assumptions that lie behind this picture? What's also the positioning in this picture? Who is serving who? Who is actually sharing knowledge? For what? For modernization, which is in the, in the other pictures, or for really, truly locally geared development? So this is some of the, the thoughts that we think that prevailed in those days, that we know that prevailed in those days. We are not there anymore now. This is today. But we know that sometimes these kind of thoughts around um, we sharing knowledge towards, or knowledge agendas being driven by, uh, other actors than local actors, still prevail in our current practices of collaboration. And we think that can, that can be truly different. Here at KID, we try. We really are, have the best intentions to establish knowledge partnerships on an equal footing. And I think at present, we have also testimonies of that. Only to, tomorrow, for example, there will be a lot of students here in this same room uh, graduating for uh, their masters in public health. And you see here a photo of a former graduation. And here you can see how they are on equal footing, standing next to each other. They are in class, outside of class, totally uh, equal in sharing knowledge and learning from each other. Many of them are here with us today. And it's, again, a, t a token of how uh, true collaboration and true learning from each other can happen 
But at the same time at KIT, we also see that uh, there are sometimes still um, practices in the way that we partner that we would rather see differently. So, it's time to move faster. We've already walked quite a long distance from 1949 till now, but we need to move faster. We need to take quicker distance from what was and to where we want to go. Where do we want to go? We don't always know yet, to be honest. That's actually what we would love to explore also together with you today. I guess we want to paint a fourth picture next to the three that are already on the wall, on a way of partnership that is really, really true to what we believe in. Yeah, what have we already done? Here at KIT, we've been discussing this a lot. We've been trying to formulate a new strategy where we actually explicitly mention that we want to become a global partnership organization instead of an Amsterdam-based institute working um, internationally. And we have, done, uh, we, are, we have done a lot more other things, but it's not enough. It's not enough. So we want to move faster, and we want to do that with you. We know that we can only do it together. So that's why I'm so grateful and I'm so happy that you turned out uh, to be here with us today and that together we can have these discussions. And they won't be easy. They might be leading to some uncomfortable uh, discussions like Ama just mentioned. Uh, because to really transformatively change, we need to really, really, really also reflect upon our own position. So. Let's uh, walk together, independently of where you are. I really, really hope that you'll be inspired today to take a different route or just walk on, on what you were already choosing, to allow yourself to get lost, to stumble, to ask for directions and find your way to again. I wish you a very good walk and a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for, for your opening remarks and for raising these three very, very important questions. Who, in fact, has access to? Who, in fact, sets the agenda? And who validates what is generated as knowledge, right? And in figuring this out, in creating different types of partnerships, let's uh, move faster, guys. Pick up the pace. Pick up the pace, but also stay together. Let's do it together. That's complex stuff. It's not so easy, but we will start. We will do it here together, and we're talking about power. We're going to talk to a lot of powerful people, and I hope at the end of listening to and talking with powerful people, we remember that we ourselves are each powerful. Don't let anybody fool you. Um, now, speaking of powerful people, I would like to uh, uh, now ask you all to welcome Pascal Grotehuis. Uh, she is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, she's the Director General, a uh, Director of Development and Ambassador for Gender Equality. Uh, please give her a warm round of applause. Hi, thank you. Welcome. A very good morning to all of you, and I'm not sure if I classify as a powerful person, but I will do my best, and I think uh, all of us here are actually very powerful together. So a very good morning uh, to the colleagues of the KIT, to um, AT Expert in uh, South Africa and Asfari Institute in Lebanon. I don't know if you're still online, but it's really good to see you, and I know that there are many of my colleagues online, but many probably of your colleagues as well. So it's great to be here, and um, a very good morning. So let me introduce myself. My name is, uh, you, you just said it, but uh, I'm Pascal Grotehuis. I'm the ambassador for women's rights and gender equality and also the director for social development at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And thank you, Lindy, for inviting us to join you in a real partnership today. It's, uh, it's really cool to be at the first power of knowledge and I, I hope and wish there will be many more to follow. Maybe talking about um, partnerships um, and also talking about our relationship and our partnership with kids. KIT has been a long-standing and appreciated partner of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think of ShareNet International, the knowledge platform on sexual and reproductive health and rights hosted by KIT. I think of the Orange Knowledge Program with NEFIC and its scholarships, including the courses of KIT. I also think of KIT as a dialogue partner in the broadest sense of the word. And I would like to compliment you on your ongoing self-reflection and self-improvement on your role in international cooperation and knowledge development. 
and for explicitly including institutions from Lebanon and Pretoria, and scholars and activists from all around the world. As you probably know, in June, our Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, Liesje Schreinemacher, presented her new policy document, Doing What the Netherlands is Good At, which will be discussed in Parliament later this month. More focus, specific specifically on what works, with a view to more enduring results in a world with fundamental challenges and a changing and complex geopolitical context are central to this policy. Localizing aid, programming more flexibly, focusing on those marginalized, and meaningful engaging young people, and conducting a feminist foreign policy, feature prominently in this vision. And this policy note, and that's the first, it was formulated with input from broad and worldwide consultation, uh, online consultations, roundtables, with civil society, knowledge institutions, the private sector, and our own Youth Advisory Council of the Dutch Foreign Affairs Ministry. And in today's conference, I think it's fitting to also mention the knowledge and learning program of our policy framework for strengthening civil society. This program will start later this month with a launch in each of the seven countries where this learning will be situated, engaging local academic scholars and tested knowledge holders. And of course, the Youth Advisory Council is participating because we strongly believe in to practice what we preach. And are we perfect? Not at all. And I think uh, today's um, very important topic is at the heart of our discussions as well. Maybe talking a little bit about feminist foreign policy, which is a topic very close to my heart. As you all know, our policies have been supporting women's rights and gender equality of all women and girls for many years. However, our political leadership is ambitious to do more. And that is why we are currently formulating a more explicit for feminist foreign policy, like other countries like Sweden, France, Spain, Luxembourg, um, Canada, and even also Mexico and Chile has gone before us. And a feminist foreign policy touches upon rights, about inequalities, and about power relations. And as Lindy said, it's not always comfortable, also not within our own ministry, to talk about these power struggles and changing power relations. And in this, this sense, I think a feminist foreign policy also touches very much upon the topic that you're discussing today. A feminist foreign policy focuses on four R's that we took from the Swedes, because sometimes people went before you and you can learn from that. It's about rights, it's about resources, putting your money where your mouth is. It's about representation, to have everybody at, table that, at the table that matters. And it's about a reality check to test um, our ideas in a local context, to do no harm. As Ambassador for Women's Rights and Gender Equality, and with our policy note in mind, I think my warm encouragement to you today is in, in all your deliberations and, and your discussions, um, to include addressing the gender gap, and to include addressing the youth gap. To improve the lives of the people we serve, together with these people. As I would like to conclude, let me express appreciation for KIT for engaging the Foreign Affairs Ministry as a government, as a donor, and also as a partner in this event. A ministry has a specific role. It's, it's sometimes complicated when you're, uh, when you're a diplomat, when you're a civil servant, but also sometimes a bit of an activist. But the role of the government is about implementing policies within a set of framework and accounting to Parliament for spending the taxpayers' money. And within this framework and with clear boundaries, it's how we work. And that, is, that actually means today, and I'm, I'm joined by my colleagues Lily and Rainier here, and I know Dirk Jan Koch is online and probably many more colleagues, but for us it's really important to listen and that we look into learning and what we can we take from the discussions today into our own discussions. On today's topic, some suggestions for food for thought. They could come from philosopher philosopher Michel Foucault on the intricate relations between knowledge and power. Another suggestion could come from the work from Mordena Marshall, academic and elder of the Mi'kmaq community in Northeast Canada, who created the Integrative Science Program, enabling students to learn indigenous and mainstream sciences side by side as science courses in a science degree. Lastly, 
in revisiting development approaches and development studies, my own study, how to retain the imperative of global solidarity and justice, which academic Olivia Ruta Zipwa refers to in on babies and bathwater. So I think today's meeting and all of you here online and uh, in this beautiful room, it's really timely. It's something that is at the heart of our policies, it's in the heart of our societies. And I wish you fruitful discussions, new connections, new ideas. I think, Anna, you said it, a lot of fun too. And a true spirit of togetherness. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you so much for your address. And I've been waiting for this moment. Perhaps you could uh, join me on stage uh, still, because I think we have time for a question. So I get to throw it. <laughs> um, and it's very likely that I, I will fail. <laughs> but I have to be uh, confident and, and courageous, right, to fail. And if I fail, you correct me. And that's <laughs> how we will do this knowledge transfer thing. So it starts with throwing uh, a box. Who has a question? We have time for one question. Maybe someone has a burning question, or the fire is only starting to, it's not yet, they're little embers of a question. Anybody? The knowledge is inside. Oh, the way there? No, I think really? I think this one is closer. Okay, this one's, <laughs> I'm sorry, this one is closer. <laughs> That's the only reason I'm going to, are you gonna catch? And don't forget to speak, very good, speak into the box. Do you hear me? Like you're whispering into your lover's ear. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. yes. I, I didn't want to ask a question, but I'll, uh, I'll break the ice. So, uh, Pascal, we go back some a time. A long time. You moved on, I moved out. Oh. So my question, and that has to do with my age, is, is this really new? And what is new? Yeah. Has the context changed? Did we make a lot of mistakes in the past? Or have we learned a lot, so we know better now? So, can you and, help us? And what us? do you mean with new? What are you referring to? Ooh. Well, I've worked on the ministers who stressed continuously, it's about cooperation. Yeah. It's about the South. I remember the man, and most, most people still will remember here, who said, don't forget the poor. Yeah. Forget the marginals, not only the elite, etc., etc." And now here we are, and I think, fantastic idea of Kit, but what is new? Has the context changed? Do we, have we learned a lot so we can move on in a more productive way? Have we made mistakes we will not make again? I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled at the beginning of the conference. Yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah, she'll catch sure. it, she'll catch it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, Rob, I think you always ask very smart questions and also many questions. It's not only one question, so <laughs> I think uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer. Is it new? No, probably not. Um, but what I feel is new is that it's more systemic. I think there were always in the ministry uh, frontrunners and people who um, have worked a lot in, in, uh, in Africa or Asia or Latin America. Um, and those people were great. And I think, but it was sometimes a personal mission uh, of the minister, of certain people in the ministry. And I think if you now look at meaningful youth participation, it's systemic. It's something that we um, monitor that is the responsibility of all and not of a few enlightened, hardworking, dedicated people. And the same goes with the feminist foreign policy. Um, it's something that everybody has to work on. It's from everybody. It's not from me the, as the ambassador for women's rights, but it's from both the ministers, it's from the personnel department, it's from all the ambassadors, and people are being um, awarded or reprimanded. I think that's probably a too big of a word, but people notice if you don't follow the lead. And I think it's across the board. It's, it's, it's for um, security policy, it's political, it's European, and it's a development uh, cooperation. So I think in that way, I feel that it has changed more. And yes, has the context changed? Yes, significantly, I think. Um, and I think many people working in development and also in, in politics and, and uh, economy already knew about the interconnectedness. But I think actually, to be very honest, COVID, um, showed to the world, to the, to the non-practitioners or the non-believers, how interconnected we are. 
Um, and it had two responses. Eh? So one, everybody was looking inside into their own national country um, and the national needs. But I think many other people also looked internationally out of solidarity, but also about through connectiveness. Um, so I think it, it helped. And also the whole online uh, connection. I think COVID had a lot of bad things, but it also had a few silver linings that I think we cannot and will not let go again. So has it changed? Yes, because I think it's more systemic than it was. And I think the urgency with everything going on around the world, uh, and I think sometimes we're still confused about what's happening in the world and how everything is related and how, uh, connected, to be honest. Um, but I think it has changed and it's now part of everybody's DNA. And if it's not part of your DNA, I, I think people are working really hard to get it part of the DNA. That's a beautiful uh, answer. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question and thank you for your answer that thank links you. so nicely to what we're doing here. Um, thank you. Thank you. So it's, it's more systemic now. It's more about togetherness and interconnectedness. Now we have uh, um, three keynotes lined up for you. And uh, I would like to ask your attention for the three keynotes and after that, we will throw again the box. So I hope you get ready and you listen attentively. So please, our first keynote speaker, I had a wonderful dinner with her yesterday. She knows so much and she's a powerful person as well. Her name is Wanjiru Kamau Rottenberg. Please give her a warm round of applause. <laughs> she's the executive in resident at Smith Futures and she's building an initiative focused on senior executive black women leaders globally. So I'm sure she has so much to say about this. She does so much more, but the floor is hers. I'm not going to tell you. If you want to know, ask her. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? This is so awesome. <laughs> OK, so I have, just to help me not get too off track, I have some things I've written down. And then I'm hoping to have enough time to just go off script and just ramble. Um, so, bear with me. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking the organizers, Kit. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to finally make it outside of Schiphol, Schiphol Airport. I've been to this country many times, but only to the airport. And so, this is my first time outside of the airport and in Amsterdam. So, thank you for that opportunity to see the world. Appreciate that. I want to thank our previous speakers. I want to thank our audiences in South Africa, in Lebanon, and online around the world. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to whisper into your ears. Um, and look at this. Look at this building. What a beautiful building. Um, someone's ancestors did an amazing job with this place. <laughs> There's that. But one of the things that blew my mind in learning about this building yesterday, and we got a, a bit of a tour of, of the space yesterday, one of the things that really blew my mind is that it's actually not that old. Maybe 100 years old, like 1916, I think I heard, the building was open, so just, just a little over 100 years old. And then I, I recently got to spend time with my grandmother, and... This building was built with all the might of the colonial Dutch government just before my grandmother was born. And when she was a girl, the knowledge, decisions, and power that were held in this building, this space we're sitting in, that knowledge and power was busy mowing down Indonesian forests with all the colonial might possible. That was just the other day. It's not too long ago. And I'm saying that and, and reflecting on that because we talk about decolonizing as if it's stuff that happened a long, long time ago. In my grandmother's lifetime, decisions made in rooms here caused catastrophes that we're trying to deal with around climate change. But I'll get to that. Today, we can sit and wiggle in our seats, uncomfortable because, of the build, because this building is an undeniable testament to Dutch colonial violence. Right out there in that marble hall, 
is some of the first examples or the earliest examples I've seen of public-private partnerships. Today we talk about PPPs as if they're going to end global poverty and, and reverse everything we've done wrong with the world. Right out there, those names, those families, those companies partnered with government to go out to Indonesia and mow down indigenous forests there. When we talk about decolonizing things, public-private partnerships, the example's right there. So again, calling us into this space with an awareness of the things we're trying to decolonize aren't out there, they are contemporary con conversations right now. Anyway, inspired by the complicated history of this space and this institution, KIT, I want today to reflect on the intersection of history, knowledge, and power. And when I say history, again, remember I'm not talking about stuff back then, I'm talking about lived realities today as continuations of what our ancestors did. But first, in that very African of traditions, allow me to begin by locating myself and my intellectual and activist lineage, as well as naming in honor those who have come before me and on whose giant shoulders I stand. I am a black African woman and a black feminist. I locate my black feminist thought as part of a legacy of work sometimes written down, as in the words of America's Bell Hooks, Ghana's Amata Aidu, Kenya's Patricia Kameri Mbote, and others, but also marked in the ways of living and doing the work of liberation. The lives of America's Sojourner Truth, Kenya's Wangari Mathai, Mozambique and South Africa's Gracia Michelle and Brazil's Marielle Franco inspire and light the path for me. When I identify as a black feminist, I'm talking about my aspiration to live a life committed and working towards liberation, speaking back to white patriarchy at every turn. My black feminism, by virtue of giving me the skills and tools to name and navigate the intersection of patriarchy and racist power structures, is the basis from which I am able to see and hopefully articulate interesting possibilities to imagine decolonizing knowledge and as such, liberation for all. Now, Let's turn to that intersection of history, knowledge, and power, and begin with an exploration of who gets to produce knowledge as the first port of call if we are to decolonize knowledge. Who gets to produce knowledge? And that has been mentioned. The first two speakers talked about who gets to produce knowledge as where we must start if we're to decolonize. Inspired by last night's dinner, uh, it was a fantastic conversation. Um, you all have really good beer out here too, I have to say. Um, I'd like to zero in on the topic of climate change, where it has been rightly argued that cli climate science reports have an Africa-shaped gap. It is well documented that the African continent is highly vulnerable to climate change, yet only eight of 91 of the 91 lead authors of the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree global warming were from Africa, with a majority coming from South Africa. It's not just that African voices aren't making it to the global agenda setting reports. We actually know why those voices aren't making it into those reports. Research funding for climate change is also skewed, with institutions based in Europe and North America receiving 78% of the funding available, while African institutions receive just 14.5% of those resources. The result is there's very little climate ob observation infrastructure in Africa, and therefore very little is known about what is actually happening in terms of climate impacts on the continent. It means we are currently using European data to model and extrapolate predictions for how the climate will change on the African continent. That's what we're doing. 
the models that we're using to try and predict what's ha going to happen in Africa are not based on African data because we haven't been collecting the African data. When it comes to understanding climate change in Africa, we are largely flying the plane blind, and yet, as COVID has taught us, we're living in an increasingly interconnected world, and a crisis in one part of the world will eventually find its way to your front door. To be clear, the reality of who's getting to produce knowledge on climate change is not because Africans don't have the skills or the desire to help understand what climate change might look like for us on the continent. It's not that we don't want to or that we can't. In my previous role as the director of award, African Women in Agricultural Research and Development, we ran a capacity building fellowship for African women scientists. It had an acceptance rate lower than that of Harvard. It was harder to get into the award fellowship than it was to get into Harvard. We were overwhelmed by the numbers of African women scientists who were seeking the opportunity to improve their ability to produce locally relevant knowledge. Their resources were never enough to meet demand. When we talk about decolonizing knowledge, I'd love for us to start from there from a conversation about resources. There can be no decolonizing of knowledge until we address the serious disparities in who has access to resources to produce knowledge. And once we start having a conversation, a really serious conversation about who has access to resources to produce knowledge, we then must start by recognizing that the systemic underinvestment in African science has colonial roots. Across Europe, scientific prowess was made possible and remains based on violent extra extraction of resources from the colonies. This building, the physical building we're in, is testament to that. The science that was done here, the research that was done here, was based on extraction of resources from the colonies. As Walter Rodney in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, reminds us, the reality of colonialism is not just that it extracted resources, it's also that colonialism disrupted and brought to an end Africa's own knowledge production. It's not just that it took, it's what it undid, it's what it killed that was happening. Can you imagine if colonialism never happened? What indigenous and local knowledge of the natural world have we lost that we might still have? Perhaps that knowledge would help us better antip anticipate and adapt to a changing climate. Heck, perhaps we wouldn't even have climate change in the first place. I mean, there's a tree library here in this building that to me, it was absolutely chilling. You stand in this room and there's samples of trees, many of them now extinct, that were being cut down across Indonesian forests. If those trees hadn't been mowed down to build this and other Dutch prosperity, maybe we wouldn't be in the pickle, quite literally, that we're in. In shifting gears, I do think, though, that it is easier to find fault in the ways of generations past than to see the ways that we ourselves are engaging in colonial practices that our descendants will find abhorrent and need to repair. I'm concerned that current conversations on climate change continues to obfuscate reality with language such as shared responsibility for climate change. Now, I agree, we have a shared problem. Our house is too hot, it's on fire, planet Earth. However, we do not have shared responsibility. Uh-uh. <laughs> we are in this climate change mess because of very particular actions in very particular parts of the world. There has to be accountability for that history and bills have to get 
paid. The renewable energy conversation that we're having right now, where Africa is expected to abandon using our natural gas resources because natural gas causes climate change, smacks of old colonial paternalism with a fresh coat of paint. We're not having it. Why should poor Africans have to subsidize European lifestyles. Because that's what we're asking Africans to do. When we start using the language of shared responsibility, we are asking poor Africans who were made poor by the colonial project to subsidize the air conditioning of this and other rooms across Europe. That's not fair. The Ukraine war starts. What does Europe do? Immediately ramps up its use of natural gas, while at the same time telling Africans to not use our natural gas reserves to do the kind of development to end the poverty of our people, to keep our children alive and figure out how to feed our people. A truly decolonized conversation would look different. So again, when we talk about decolonizing knowledge, we're not talking about conversations from back then. There's ways we're talking to each other today that are colonial, that need to be unpacked and stopped. Okay, I'm gonna finish with what gives me hope, because I do walk around quite happy and quite hopeful. <laughs> Despite the frustrations and the anger that I feel, I'm also incredibly hopeful. And there's a couple of things that give me hope I want to share too. One, um, when I pick up my black feminist lens to look out into the world, I see a couple of things that make me happy and excited. I see the tenacity of African scientists. And, and he, he, here's some of what, oh, my time is way up. Okay. Um, what we call science today is hundreds of years old in Europe, yet because of colonialism, it's only about 50 years old on the African continent. And in interesting ways, I'm excited because whereas you in Europe are working with ideas of who gets to do science that are set in hundreds of years, centuries of history, we have we on the continent are working really with wet concrete. We have opportunities to redefine what science is and how science can be done in a way that's much more human-centered, in a way that's more gender-responsive, in a way that doesn't lock women out and other minorities out than you here in Europe. In my work with AWARD, working with African women scientists, I actually got to start sympathizing with European women scientists who have to push back against centuries of history that have kept women from innovation and science in a way that African women haven't quite got that same burden. Now, mind you, we've got other burdens, but I feel for y'all sisters out here. It's rough. The other thing that gives me hope is looking at young people and here in youth activism. And I know y'all may try and crop out our Ugandan sisters from the photos of young climate change activists. You know what I'm talking about. But, you know, we'll take our European young women and we've got our climate activists on the continent too and they encourage me, they give me hope. And I want to close with the words of Khalil Gibran, who reminds us in one of my favorite books of all time um, about children. And he says, of children, you may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backwards, nor tarries with yesterday. 
the fact that life doesn't go backwards and we've got young people who are so committed and who see so much more clearly than our ancestors did and than we do, that gives me hope. And I hope you join me in sharing that hope. Thank you. Well, that was quite a start. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wanjiru. Um, I'm so happy we had that dinner last night, and uh, I hope all of you wish you were there. Uh, we'll move on. I promised you three keynotes. Uh, we have uh, a fantastic speaker. He was also at dinner yesterday. We had a very, very dynamic dinner. Let's put it that way. His name is Samuel Oji Oti. A warm round of applause for him. He's very entrepreneurial. He's a senior program specialist at IDRC, which is the Institute for Development Research Center, or International Development Research Center. And um, he is uh, the member of the Global Health Decolonization Movement in Africa. He's doing things. Founding Secretary General of the Network of Impact Evaluation Researchers in Africa and inaugural member of Global Health Decolonization Movement. And he's also got a podcast, for those of you who listen to podcasts. Uh, he's the creator of the MedX Tech Africa podcast. So note that down. Maybe he'll tell you more about it in his keynote. No, Mike is... Okay, uh, we need some tech, yeah. Good to see the gaps in technology sometimes. Is it fine? Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, great, thank you. Um, I, I hope to be a little bit provocative, not as prog provocative as uh, one you. Um, <laughs> and believe me, when it comes to being provocative, I've learned from the very best. Uh, my six-year-old daughter has a PhD in <laughs> provocation, and <laughs> the four-year-old has a master's, and, and my wife describes them as being strong-willed. Uh, but if you were to ask me, I'd probably use much less magnanimous <laughs> words, uh, especially when the older one questions if I'm actually a real doctor, um, <laughs> because uh, she's never seen me in a hospital. Um, uh, so she doesn't understand how I can still claim to be one. But, but one day she'll understand what it is that I really do, uh, and that is grant making. I work for a Canadian fund, uh, funding agency, um, and we fund a variety of issues, including climate change research, and global health, which is my background. And, and prior to that, I was a public health researcher in Africa for, for many years. And in the course of what I do, um, I've come to recognize that there are deeply entrenched uh, power imbalances in the discipline of, of global health. Um, global health practitioners and institutions in powerful countries generally occupy a position of privilege relative to their counterparts in, in less powerful countries. Um, and, and as altruistic as many of us in global health believe that we are, and as much progress as we have made in global health on issues such as eradicating smallpox, largely bringing HIV and AIDS under control, these power imbalances are harmful, I, I believe, to a discipline that is meant to embody equity uh, as, its, as its essence. And, and so I believe that the first and most important step towards tackling these power imbalances is, is for us to speak up about them. And, and that's why I didn't hesitate to, become, to, to attend and participate uh, in this event. Um, you see, as, as an African global health practitioner, I'm thankful to the field of global health. I, I can't deny that. Um, I'm thankful for what it has done for my continent uh, and for me as an, as an individual. Uh, some of the most fulfilling and meaningful partnerships and relationships that I've had in my professional career have been as a result of collaborating with, with um, global health practitioners, many of whom are in, in the global north or in powerful countries, as I prefer to, to frame it. Uh, and in fact, I earned my PhD right here uh, in, in Amsterdam. And, and, and that experience just showed me the power of co-creation and the power of having a diverse group of people around the table 
who see each other as, as peers and, and as equals. Um, and interestingly, at the time, yes, my, my colleagues in Amsterdam had you know, a level of technical competency that I had not yet, uh, yet attained to at the time. But I had a much deeper understanding of the specific African context where we were implementing our research. And so I never felt like uh, my context competency was valued any less than their technical competency. Um, but I can't stand here and pretend that it's all been roses and, uh, uh, and fairies. Um, there have been quite a number of, of harmful and, and regrettable uh, practices. And, and to be more precise, what I'm trying to say is that the practice of global health and perhaps of international development in general is marred by a differential treatment of practitioners and institutions in less powerful countries, as, as Wanju alluded to. Uh, and I believe that it's this uh, differential treatment and, and perhaps the institutionalization of this uh, differential treatment through um, intersectional systems of sociopolitical injustices, that is what is being perceived by those of us in the global south as manifestations of coloniality in, in, in global health. And, and, and this differential treatment, it, it plays out in our minds as some kind of, of deja vu, uh, if you will. Um, we know that our grandparents and their parents, uh, when Jiku talked about her grandparents, we were treated differently or differentially by, by powerful countries. Uh, and now in the discipline of global health and of international de development, so are we. Uh, the difference is that our grandparents were subjugated using guns, chains and whips, while we are being subjugated using emails, Zoom calls and grant proposals. And in this state of quasi-deja quasi vu, we perceive coloniality whenever researchers from powerful countries invade our countries, use us as, as data donkeys, and relegate us to the fine print in the acknowledgement section of their peer-reviewed publications, if, if we are even lucky. We perceive coloniality whenever funders and international donors, majority of which are domiciled in powerful countries, act as if they're doing us a favor while pretending not to know that there is an interdependent causative relationship between the wealth of their countries and the underdevelopment of ours. We perceive coloniality when curricula in leading public health schools fails to acknowledge the colonial history of global health, continues to minimize the lived experiences and expertise of people in less powerful countries, and also continues to churn out graduates who believe that Africa and the developing world needs to be rescued and that they are the ones who can rescue us. And I have to say this, we perceive coloniality when a disease that affects us only becomes a global health priority when it affects you all. And I could go on and on. So there's no doubt in my mind that powerful countries have an oversized influence on global health. And, and we saw this oversized influence in the, with the unequal distribution of, of COVID-19 vaccines, and we're even seeing it now with, with monkeypox. Um, and in fact, it was around that period of what some people framed as vaccine apartheid uh, that I personally um, started paying more serious attention to conversations on decolonizing global health. And I recognized immediately as usual, African voices are or were largely underrepresented in, in these conversations. And so when the global health decolonization movement came calling, I, I didn't hesitate to become part of it. And we are on a mission to mobilize African voices to speak out about what we perceive as the manifestations of coloniality in global health. And one of the products of our efforts is a publication which is on our website, and it's entitled Pragmatic Approaches to Decolonizing Global Health in Africa. And in this document, we propose what we call common sense approaches to decolonizing global health. And we address different constituencies, funders, academic institutions, scientific journals, even the media, all complicit in perpetrating these power imbalances in global health. And so we address each of these constituencies and provide practical recommendations on what needs to change. For example, we point out to funders that it is crucial for them to e examine who sits in their boards who sits in scientific review panels. We remind them that what matters is not just who sits at the table, but on what terms. In other words, tokenism is simply not good enough. We raise the issue of epistemic injustice and how that remains deeply entrenched in global health academia. 
and we ask academics in powerful countries to make a deliberate effort to show higher regard for local and indigenous knowledge and expertise. We ask researchers in powerful countries to acknowledge their privileges and become true allies of researchers in less powerful countries. And on, on the issue of, of privilege, I know it's such a dirty word, um, but I think that is because it is, it is misunderstood. Uh, we all have some kind of privilege, white versus black, men versus women, tall versus vertically challenged. We all have some level of, of privilege. But, but privilege is, is not about deserving what you have. It is really about the absence of, of impediment. And so when you have privilege, you really don't notice it. But when you do not have it, it pretty much affects everything that you do. For example, if you've never had to face the humiliation of applying for a visa to attend a scientific conference, then you will never appreciate what it means to have passport privilege. You'll never, you'll be like, what are these guys talking about? And, and well, I mean, generally the response to our guidelines has been quite encouraging. We've had several global health practitioners in, in powerful countries reaching out to pledge their allyship, and, and time will tell if, if they really mean it. But we acknowledge that our recommendations only scratch the surface and that it will take much more to dismantle the socioeconomic and political structures that perpetuate these power asymmetries in, in the global health knowledge system. And we even know that not everyone, including some people in, in less powerful countries, agree with the use of the term decolonization. Not everyone is happy with, with that term. And some scholars have even accused us of, of hijacking the term and turning it into a verb, right? Um, and others keep screaming at us, decolonization is not a synonym for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We get it. Hold your horses. We get it, right? But we also know that it's impossible to find a framing that resonates with everyone. And that's why I strongly agree with Dr. Sheye Abimbola. He's the editor-in-chief editor of BMJ Global Health, who insists on what he calls a disciplined plurality when it comes to the issue of decolonizing global health. In other words, it is perfectly okay for us to have different positionalities on, on framing the issue. Overall, we acknowledge the many imperfections of our movement, but we are convinced that we must start somewhere. We must be vocal, we need to, start to change, challenge the status quo, and we need to advocate for common sense at the bare minimum, at the bare minimum. And believe me, it's not easy being us. I personally have received some very interesting messages on social media. Uh, one person sent me a message on Twitter uh, that said, and I quote, uh, fundamentally some adversarial decolonization frames oppressor versus oppressed are unnecessarily divisive and unlikely to gain broad support. Such approaches are unhelpful and ironically colonial. End of quote. So they ended up calling me the colonialist. There you go. And by the way, that's one of the nicer comments that I have received. But you know what? I'm speaking now because I honestly believe that most of us from powerful and less powerful countries alike are in the field of global health for good reasons. We want to save lives, we, we want to make a positive difference on, uh, in the world. And so I, 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 I'm hopeful that we all see these pragmatic calls for decolonization for what they are intended to be. They are not a, an, attempt, an attempt to demonize global health practitioners in the global north or in powerful countries. They are not an attempt to co-opt or diminish the contribution of true scholars to decolonization, such as Franz Fanon and Anibal Kijano. And they are not intended to create a false dichotomy between practical and conceptual or philosophical approaches. We see this cause as a contribution to what must be a multifaceted approach to decolonizing knowledge systems in global health and beyond. And our hope is that our common sense approaches will inspire true reflection and perhaps an existential shift in consciousness that will enable all of us to strive towards more ethical uh, and equitable knowledge partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these two keynote addresses. How are we doing? I hope uh, we are feeling some discomfort. I hope that uh, we feel that uh, this is just the beginning, that there's going to be some deepening. We've started quite deep, I think, but maybe 
I just am shallow. Um, <clears throat> I would like to introduce our third and final keynote speaker, Dr. Zuleika Bibi Sheikh. She is a lecturer in sociology, black studies, and intersectionality, formerly at the University of Port Portsmouth That's and right. currently at the University of Utrecht. A warm round of applause for her. <clears throat> Knowledge. I am hungry for it. With gluttonous abandon, I devour it, leaving you depleted, exhausted, drained. Still, you come back for more. Why? Because I promised you something? A piece of paper? Legitimacy? A seat? A table? Ah, your ancestors fell for that too. So many generations, yet so little learned. Once a coolie, always a coolie. You say you are doing this for them, but you did not heed their warning. Silly, they could not read. What's your excuse, a print too small? You can stay here, you know, and feed off the knowledges of others as I do. Drain them, deplete them, leave them worse off than before. Call this research. We will reward you, praise you. Hell, we'll even give you that piece of paper. Go on, then. This is what you came for. Cannibalize yourself in the pursuit of knowledge. Gnaw on the bones of your ancestors. Drink their blood spilled in the sugarcane field so that you may arise anew in my own image. And whilst we drown you in a black gown, think not of your ancestors draped in the Kalapani. Think not of their sweat fertilizing the soil. Think not of their tears watering the sugarcane. Think not of their backs broken to sweeten my tea. Think instead that you are one of us now and feast. The title of my talk this morning is Decolonial Discomfort and centers on the discomfort necessary in doing decolonial work. If we are to attempt to build more equitable partnerships, more inclusive, sustainable societies, we need to start with discomfort. I started with this poem, which I wrote uh, back in 2018, as it's one that simultaneously raises discomfort in its naming of the colonial wound, whilst also pointing to disconnection. What happens to our bodies when we feel discomfort? We tense up, our breath shortens, our heart races, we disconnect. We stop listening because our mind is racing for a way to escape to find comfort in what we already know. It shuts down the possibility to learn, to gain new knowledges. In partnerships, someone mentions white privilege, discomfort. Someone mentions race, discomfort. Colonization, discomfort. Slavery, discomfort. Patriarchy, intersectionality, identity, discomfort. And in attempting to escape it, we deflect usually with anger, with aggression, with gaslighting, towards the one who has caused the discomfort, because they have touched upon a key insecurity. You see, we all want to be the good guys. We want to be seen to be helping, as working to make the world a better place. None of us want to be the villains in the fairy tale. And I use fairy tale here with intent because this is exactly the myth modernity has taught us to believe, that the, individually, that the individual in its primacy is inherently good, well-meaning, and pure. The individual with human rights, citizenship, humanity, independence, and the ability to own a land as property is good. But here's the catch. The existence of that individual is contingent upon the existence of others, excluded from its de definition through violence, oppression, and genocide, who are imprisoned for this individual's safety, who are stateless refugees, asylum seekers, um, boarded, denied entry at borders for the exclusivity of this individual's citizenship. 
dehumanized to give this individual something to save, stripped of land and territory so the individual can own. And yet, we cling to this identity of the individual without asking ourselves upon whose freedom is it contingent? What are we asking to be represented in? Upon whose back will I stand as I reach for success? This bring me, brings me back to the poem, to the discomfort and insecurity it brought with its existence, what it had revealed in its penning. Shame. The shame that comes along with recognizing the ways in which I had become out of relation, my complicity in the silencing of others, the enacting of violence under colonial logics. The shame and guilt that comes along with having reproduced the violence I and we claim to be against while playing the role of the good guy. The unraveling of the individual I, the decolonizing of the self was at first debilitating. Delinking from the dominant I felt like an alienation, like a losing of who I thought I was and all that I knew, all that I had taken years of studying in order to master. In retrospect, it was a shedding. It was necessary for the return to relationality through reclaiming my indigenous knowledges, for re-existence, so I can work and we can work towards collective liberation. It is in the bringing into question our internalized oppressions that we start to reflect on the ways in which modernity, coloniality, capitalism, patriarchy has wounded us all leading us to question dominant frameworks, concepts, and ideas. And it's only through this discomfort that we can find the possibility of creating the fertile ground that could possibly nurture equitable partnerships. Vital because there's something much more important at stake than our relations with each other. As we sit here, one-third of Pakistan is currently underwater after unprecedented floods. Floods which just a few months ago devastated my home province of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Of the increased incidences of red tides which I recently witnessed in Yucatan province in Mexico, where starved of oxygen six tons of fish um, washed ashore, either dead or gasping for breath the wildfires and rising temperatures here over the summer. As Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, reminds us, open quotes, it's not, it's not just land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to land. Close quotes. In my teaching, I often use the work of Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang particularly their now decade-old seminal work, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, in which they make clear that decolonization cannot merely be grafted onto pre-existing discourses or frameworks. In their words, open quotes, decolonization is not a swappable term for other things we want to do to improve our schools and societies. Decolonization doesn't have a synonym. <laughs> decolonization is about land. As much as decolonization is about the return of land, often unceded territory to First Nations, it is about us working towards returning to land. In recognizing that the colonial wound marks us in different ways, that we find ourselves on different sides of the colonial divide, the work we need to do in our communities, in our organizations and institutions may look different, but the goal should be the same a reaching out for relations. In working through the discomfort, our disconnection, our insecurities and shame, we not only come into relation with each other, but we can come to affirm life through healing our relation to land. Through reclaiming our knowledges, we come to accept our dependency on her waters, her trees, her soil, her harvests. This is fundamentally the first partnership we need to nurture. I would like to leave you with another quote by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Open quotes. 
Knowing that you love the earth changes you, activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you, all three of you. I would like to invite our keynote speakers to join me here. It's now time for the Q&A session. I hope, um, have you managed to articulate questions in your minds yet? I'll give you a little bit of time. And maybe I need some assistance with throwing the box because I don't think I can, I can, I can multitask, but not that much. <laughs> Um, so if you have questions, okay, there's a question. I want to see the hands maybe first, so I have a sense of how many questions there are. There's one there, another one here, two gentlemen, uh, one in front here. Okay, and, and you may throw when you are done with the, your question. And thank you once again for your, for your keynote uh, addresses. I, it gave us so much to think about, but let's, let's hear the first question. Well, uh, let me join you, the moderator, in actually thanking them for this inspiring and discomforting uh, opening uh, statement. But let me also create a discomfort in asking uh, our colleagues, can we create a discomfort for the global south mm -hmm. also? In the sense that, can we start holding our leadership responsible and accountable in this journey of decolonization? Is it also not a mistake from our side? Again, looking up to the global not for a solution of the decolonization they were part of creating. Can we not start making a movement on our own rather than looking up to them again for a solution? I think we might be in a journey of repeating solutions from the global south, uh, from the global north rather than the global south. So I think we should take some level of discomfort in also stepping up in taking some responsibility from the global south. Thank you. Thank you. Is, uh, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, you can throw, but while you're doing that, is, is it a question directed at a particular speaker? I think it's both for Oji and uh, my dear big sister, uh, Wajin okay. Rin. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perhaps we can take the responses. <laughs> so I know you feel a certain way about that, so <laughs> let me allow you to go. It's true, I do feel a certain way. Uh, sorry, let's have the responses and then, and then you can uh, ask. It's perhaps on the same line. Okay, oh, all right. So that you don't, you don't answer it twice. All right, it gives you more time to reflect. And, and I yeah. like the example that you gave. So, um, so I agree with the presentations that you made, eh, that um, there are imbalances and sorry. those... Uh, just a little pause. There's a request here. If you could please introduce yourself briefly. Mm. Uh, okay. Your um, name and wh which institution? My name is Kwesi Buahene. Uh, I'm from Ghana and I work for Farm Access in Amsterdam. Thank you. All right. So I agree with the question. Um, I agree with the speakers that there are imbalances in knowledge and in partnerships. And those imbalances have so historical roots. And eh? so a lot of emphasis on colonialism, there's also discrimination, but there's also the pure human motive of taking advantage of the, the, the weak. And it can be within country, across country. But I think there's also the other side, and the gentleman emphasized part of it, and that is, uh, let me make it a bit personal. When I, I studied here, and I did my PhD here, and, and all, stuff, and I wanted to go and work in Ghana. And I sent application to so many places in Ghana, and all of them said to me that I'm not qualified. Meanwhile, other countries wanted me. So then you see there's a culture um, of, you know, favoring some, uh, you know, above others. In addition to that, there is also uh, the point about what is the, how are we actually looking at knowledge 
to solve our own problems. Uh, so mention was made about climate change, and what you see in most cases is that when we talk about climate change in Africa, or particularly in Ghana, we're not really talking about climate change that affects people at the village. If you go to my village, the key problem they are dealing with is erosion. It's already warm, so they are not really thinking about <laughs> what will happen if there's a 2% change in climate. So really looking at the things that affect them and how do we address it. And the last point, and I want you to also reflect on that, is we have African Academy of Sciences. And I'm wondering, have they come together with the support of African governments to able to support a journal that in Africa we will say, if you send your publication there, it will be respected as whatever journal outside Africa. What kind of investment have you done you know, to the level that we can be proud of and say, we are matching these things you know, irrespective of the world? And lastly, the last, <laughs> no, no, I, I feel passionate that, that about this. That was the this. last one. <laughs> I feel passionate about this. The last two Japanese guys who won Nobel Prize for Medicine, they hardly spoke English, but they won it. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so some reflections. Um, for you to respond to, yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy you're excited to be the first to respond. <laughs> I'm barely sitting on my hands on this one because Sam and I had a really intense conversation about this again. Once again, y'all's beer fanta is fantastic. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. One, I, as an African, am very careful which rooms I have which conversations. So, I don't think it's my place to come all the way from the continent to this European hall to engage with Europeans on the challenges and the fights and the battles that I as an African need to have with my African leaders. This room is for me to tell the Europeans, if I'm getting on a plane, is to come here to tell Europeans, when you eat a meal, you pay the bill. That's my message to Europeans. Find me at the AU, find me at the AGRF, find me in African conversations. We go toe to toe with African leaders. I go toe to toe with African policymakers. But I think it's important to be clear in which room, and I love that about our African cultures. When you go to your in-laws, you speak a certain way, and that's different from how you speak when you're with your siblings. So that's the distinction I'm making. It doesn't mean that I'm not heavily critical of African policymakers and that I don't engage them and push them, and that we shouldn't. That's one. Second, I think it's really important to actually know and recognize and support what is happening on the continent. There's a lot going on. So for example, the Science Granting Council's work um, is really important work that's moving African governments to meet their, um, their STITSA obligations on funding research using national budgets. The Malabo um, agreements around how much we fund our agriculture sector is an important tool that we, we are, and, and cities here from Academia, Academia 2063, and the work that we're doing with the Malabo Montpellier panel in terms of supporting African governments to understand which policy drivers work. The African Academy of Science is actually incredibly active. Like all institutions, there was a moment of capturing. I think it's getting back on its feet again. Being captured by donors, eh? Go read, there's a whole nature article about what happened there. But yeah. we have to be careful as Africans. Again, to not, I'm, not, I'm not here to ask Europeans to save Africa. I'm here to ask Europeans to pay their bills for the meals they consumed. That said, when we're sitting with African leaders, we then have conversations about what policies are you driving, um, how gender responsive are those policies, but there's, there's conversations that are appropriate for different rooms. It's how I read yeah. that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, I mean, what, what more can I add to that? <laughs> but I think, you know, 
I've always said I'm not a, I'm not a decolonization scholar and I don't ever want to be labeled as one. I'm more of you know, an advocate of decolonial praxis. Uh, and so I approach it through a very pragmatic lens. Um, and from the global health decolonization perspective, we have three pillars in, 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 our, in our strategic approach to, to, to trying to advocate for change. There's strategic communications, um, there's uh, coordinated advocacy, and those are really externally looking. Right? And, and strategic communications is exactly what I hope I've tried to achieve today by being here. But there's something that is m more, something more inward looking, and that's around patient capital. Uh, and that's you know, really trying to advocate for our own governments to invest, first of all, in understanding the whole movement of decolonization and you know, trying to bring about change in their own way. Um, and so that is more inward looking. And, and, and the, the whole idea is for us to also begin to hold our governments accountable, to hold our policymakers accountable, uh, and making sure that they are not being part of the problem. And, and I always think about the, what, what I call the original colonization. And we can't run away from the fact that there were people in colonies who were complicit, who were accomplices in that original decolonization. You always have that, right? Um, and those people need to be addressed, and those people need to change the way they do things. So there is, in a nutshell, I think, we, ha we are having those conversations, but just like uh, Wanjira alluded to, it's more of an internal conversation that uh, and we don't want to air our dirty laundry in, <laughs> in public. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So there's a distinction between, you know, what we, what, what we say, where. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? I don't think I can add much Enough. more to that. I mean, just to maybe one little comment to bounce off uh, what the both of them has said is that this is the reason why this complicity, having to deal with that um, on an individual basis, is because we all are complicit. We still are complicit. And there is no such thing as having no complicity. So it's how do we minimize that complicity and how do we hold each other accountable? Um, so, yeah, I yeah. think I'll leave it there. Yeah, no, thank you very much, and thank you for sharing your reflections. I think it helps us uh, understand and shape what we're hearing here. I think there was a question here. Could you? I have the box. Ah, there, all right, all right. Mm. She has the box. Could you please, uh, when you're done asking your question, <coughs> throw it, perhaps you can put your hand up, uh, throw it over here, she will catch it. Okay. And then that will be our last. Okay. You have a um, question. Well, first, thank you for this amazing starting of the of this activity. I, uh, the three of you mentioned at some point, directly or not, the issue of climate change, and I want to focus on that. Um, we all know that climate change is related to a development model, a colonial model, or an economic model that is still in place. And now it's really uh, very fashionable to talk about women in climate change and gender and coloniality and indigenous knowledge. We see that in every report that is written about that. But I'm wondering if the funding to, to work on climate change is coming from these global financial institutions and corporations that are now creating their own research centers to basically continue with the same development model that is destroying the planet. If this knowledge is coming from these sources, can we really uh, talk about a decolonial praxis in a, in a climate change related practice that is gonna benefit these populations? And I'm talking about this specifically because I think sometimes this discourse could be very harmful. For example, now is really, uh, we see a lot of uh, efforts in uh, going to specific countries, uh, which has a patriarchal culture in which only men own the land and work on women having access to their land so that they are more resilient to climate change. And there's a lot of funding related to that coming from the north. But then my question is, are these men there really owning the land? Talking again about owning the land and our relationship with it. Or are the corporations that are giving their the seeds and buying their harvests the real owners of the land. So I'm thinking of these discourses as a way also to put again the blame in these same communities that are being uh, harmed that, by, the, by the economic model that we are uh, trying to uh, question. And this question is for Suleika. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. She took you by surprise. This is, we're alumni from the same so yeah. anyway. So this is. <laughs> Should we take the other question as well? Yeah, you can. 
Did it, well, thank you one, for helping. One minute left is okay. the signal. That, uh, there's a question over there. Oh, there's a question online. So oh. you can ask your question, and then we ask the one online. Oh, it's on the screen. OK, the question online is coming on the screen. Oh, that screen. That screen, oh. right. That's tiny. Can you see it? It says, Dr. <laughs> Sam Oti is very right. I'll, I'll just walk Qu forward yeah. and read it to you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Dr. Sam OT is very right. Big question. The discomfort is there, but what about the will to follow up with practical resets? So I'll let you uh, hold on to think about that. Mm. Then you can ask your question, because I promised you to, that you could ask your question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> hi. OK, so hi. My name is Putri. I'm from Indonesia, currently working uh, at MBC International Health Consultants and also a KIT alumni from last year. So I just have one question, actually. It's a general question addressed to all of you. Um, like, do you have suggestions of, like, how do people like me, like, for example, from the other side of the colonial divides, mm -hmm. and maybe um, from, a, from a younger generation perspective who are trying to uh, take up some space in this kind of um, discourse? My, my, my background is global health, so that for me, it's on global health. Uh, how do we do that? Because sometimes I find it's quite tricky. Yeah. That's the only mm -hmm. question. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. So how do you take up space? As a, they have a lot of things that we can learn from as well. All right. mm. Thank you very much. So those were the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you some time. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me try and tackle this very big question because it fundamentally speaks to the need of why we actually need development studies in the first place, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, I often say this that and maybe some will be offended by this, but I'd invite you to sit a little with the discomfort of it, is that if de development practitioners did the work that they're supposed to do, there wouldn't be development studies anymore. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when speaking about, you know, there's the, you know, the small d and the big D, which everyone... And, and my background is not development studies. I kind of fell into it by accident. So um, this big D and small d, and we're always looking for these sort of big solutions that are going to miraculously save some global south country from itself, right? And I think, and maybe this is also hinting upon the previous two questions, is that the work needs to be smaller. It needs to be in our everyday actions. And the way in, in which we live an ethical life, and the way that we think about the, the ways that we're consuming, not just consumption of products, but the consumption of other human beings, of other people. And so when it comes to funding, Yes, there's always get grants, big funding. It, it, it upholds this entire system, but it's fundamentally tied up with capitalism and neoliberal practices. And is that something we want to be represented in and a part of? And by working together, I feel that there's much more creative ways that we can come up with, with overcoming these big institutions. Me individually writing a grant, speaking about epistemic freedom, no one's going to give me any money. So these are things that I've already come to terms with, and they're not even things I chase anymore. Because if we're going to speak about people winning Nobel Peace Prizes or being awarded, I don't know, accolades for the type of work that they're doing, we need to redefine the way we think of success. Mm -hmm. Those are not the things we should be seeking out. We should be seeking out that our kin, the people next to us, are living in dignity. Um, so I'm going to hand over. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think I'll take the two questions together, the one online, and uh, I, I think they're sort of related. Um, and and the, the easiest answer would be to do what I think it was Nancy Reagan that said, just say no. I think they're part of the drive. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't uh, expect that. <laughs> <laughs> just say no. Um, and I know it's not as easy as that. And, and so I, I, there are two th issues. The issues of, of resources and of funding. I think that is a major contributor 
to the power asymmetries that, that we see. Who holds the money bag? Who sets the ad agenda? That is, that is, 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 a, is a massive, uh, is an, a really oversized influence that funders have. Um, and I work for a funder, and, and why I'm comfortable to even sit here and have these conversations is that that funder has a very specific mandate to work with um, researchers and research institutions in, in less powerful countries. It's encoded into the DNA uh, by an act of Canadian Parliament into the mandate of, of, of that funding agency. And so, by design, we've... We, we can't really be accused, uh, and I'm not saying we are perfect, of, of, being, uh, of being contributors to this imbalance, right? Because by design, our priority is to fund researchers and research institutions in the global south and less powerful countries. Um, of course, there are ways of bypassing that mandate. You could <laughs> use, you could just front the global south partner and still have all the power as you know, the Global North uh, partner. But we, 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 are we have mechanisms for trying to detect those power imbalances. We have restrictions on how much funding can go to a third party out of the ent entire budget, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But not all funders are, are, are that way. Um, and so the question is, how can we begin to push back against some of these funders? How can we begin to stand up to them and say, this is not the way, this, this very top-down approach to knowledge generation and to knowledge systems needs to change. How can we em empower those who are in the specific context where you want to work to, you know, sort of create that demand, you know, and, and, uh, and, and sort of shift to that, that power imbalance? And for those institutions, so what I say, so for those individuals, for those institutions that occupy a place of privilege, even if you're in a less powerful country, if you can push back, push back. Right. So I, I used to work for a, a, a global think tank that is headquartered in Africa by Africans for Africans. And there are times when funders will come to us with a specific request and we'll simply we'll look at the bottom line, we'll look at the amount and it's mind boggling. And, you know, the temptation to accept it is, is very strong, but we just say no. Right. And, and that's where I was going with, <laughs> with, with all of this. We just say no. But of course, I'm not being naive. In many instances, when you rely on soft funding, you can't just say no to, you know, to keep the lights on. But if you are, my call to you is to push back and not to be a conduit for these power imbalances. And to my, to my junior colleague from, from uh, Indonesia, um, I, I think those of us who are more senior in, from less powerful countries and powerful countries alike, we have a responsibility to shield you um, your career is still early, right? And it might be risky for you to become very vocal about something that could be detrimental to you. I I'm not going to mince mm -hmm. words. I'm just going to be quite honest with you that there, there can be retaliation. And in fact, when we're starting the global health decolonization movement, there are two other people um, who, the, just as we were about to launch, uh, they got jobs, in, one in, in an international development agency, one in an in a organization in Geneva, and both of them dropped out. And they told us, look, <laughs> um, we, we, our kids don't have trust funds. <laughs> These jobs are very attractive. Sorry, we can't be part of this movement, right? So those of us who stayed behind, it's not like we have tr trust funds for our kids either, but yeah. at least we feel a certain le level of comfort where we work and where we've come to in our careers that, uh, you know, what's the worst you're going to do to me? But, but for those who are emerging careers, we have a responsibility to shield you. We have a responsibility to create a platform where these conversations can happen, where you can listen, where you can learn, where, if possible, you can contribute anonymously <laughs> and, and not feel that threat of, of, of retaliation. Because let's face it, that, that threat is real and it, and it exists. So I'm, I'm not going to advise you to stand on the rooftop and, and shout, mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you want <laughs> to, but yeah, let, let, us take, let us take the bullets for you. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> no shots fired, <laughs> no bullets. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for for being on this, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us in Keynote. Thank you for sharing your reflections and for enriching the conversation. And uh, a warm round of applause to you as... Um
And to those of you who would like, yeah, you can, uh, who would like to still engage with the speakers, they're here all day. Um, and if all day is not enough, just get their phone numbers, their email addresses. They, I will make sure, I'm also powerful, they will engage with you. Um, so we've, um, we've come to the coffee break. It's now time you get a little break. It's a lot to digest. You can give each other a hug. You can exchange, formulate more questions. We are now going into the part where um, you will have uh, more time and space to exchange with each other. To our friends um, and colleagues online, we are uh, now going to uh, say goodbye um, because the online program is, has ended. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, I hope we find ways to continue to engage. Yes, thank you for waving at the online. Let's wave at them. Bye. Thank you for being here. Um, and now we're going to enjoy a nice cup of coffee. Um, after the coffee break, um, we will go into our workshops. Um, I believe that you have all signed up for your workshops, and there are instructions how to find your way to the workshop space. Please visit the uh, team at the, at the desk. They can help you if you have any questions. Um, they are best placed to help you find your way around. Um, and then we have our dialogue sessions. So that, that's, that's what I've explained to you now. And uh, around lunch, there's a very prestigious award being handed out, the Eggman Award, which is an award for research, uh, for innovative research in the public health sector. So the winners will be, oh, uh, there are two winners, more than one. Great revelation has started. Uh, I don't have the names, so don't worry. There's no danger that I will share those with you. Um, uh, thank you for excellent preparation to the team that makes all of this happen. And if you want to be at the award ceremony, you can join them. Uh, you do need to know that it is a first come, first serve uh, process. So if the room is full, I'm very sorry, it's full. Um, there is lunch there, so you won't have to choose between lunch and the award ceremony. So it's also good for you to know. Um, and so, those were the instructions, and I would now like to release you all to the coffee break. Thank you.